All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to an unlikely story for our very special with their friends, illustrator Gordon C. James in conversation with our very own Jeff Kinney. I have a couple of housekeeping items to start. If you lose your connection or your video, just refresh your page or exit out of your browser and jump right back in. Um, okay. Lose your sound. If you lose anything, just go ahead and um, refresh it. If you have questions for Derek or Gordon, you can type them in the ask a question box at the bottom of your screen, and you can also upvote any questions so they float to the top. Click on the green button below to purchase a copy of I Am Every Good Thing, and you will get a very special signed book plate. Author Derek Barnes and illustrator Gordon C. James' first collaboration, the picture book Crown, an Ode to the Fresh Cut, won a Caldecott Warner, a Newbery Award, Coretta Scott King author and illustrator honors, the Kirkus Prize for Young Readers, and many accolades. They are here tonight to talk about their new picture book, I Am Every Good Thing. Derek Barnes wrote the New York Times bestsellers, The King of Kindergarten and I Am Every Good Thing, as well as the critically acclaimed multi-award winning picture book, Crown, which was a huge winner at the American Library Association's Youth Media Awards, taking home four honor awards, as I said earlier. It's worth repeating. He also wrote the best-selling chapter book series, Ruby and the Booker Boys. Derek is a graduate of Jackson State University and was the first African-American creative copywriter hired by greeting cards giant Hallmark Cards. He is a native of Kansas City, Missouri, but currently lives in Charlotte, North Carolina with his wife and their four sons. Gordon C. James is the author award-winning illustrator of Crown and Ode to the Fresh Cut, written by Derek Barnes. Some of his other works include illustrations of Patrick McKissick, Patricia McKissack's, sorry, Patricia, Scraps of Time series. Born in Washington, D.C. and raised in Fort Washington, Maryland, with someone else we know, Gordon has been pursuing an art career ever since attending high school at the Center for the Visual and Performing Arts in Forestville, Maryland. From there, he went on to earn a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in illustration from the School of Visual Arts in New York City. After a national search in 1997, Gordon was one of only two full-time illustrators hired to work for Hallmark Cards. As an award-winning fine artist, Gordon worked to achieve the highest level of craftsmanship and beauty. These qualities have led to his paintings being featured in International Artist Magazine and his work being part of the Paul R. Jones Collection at the University of Alabama. He brings these same qualities to his picture books. He says of his work, when people see my art, I want them to say, I know that person, I know that feeling. And he absolutely achieves that in I Am Every Good Thing. James also wrote resides in Charlotte, North Carolina with his wife, Ingrid, their children, Astrid and Gabriel, and their dog, Rascal. Given the accolades for Crown, the expectations were pretty high for I Am Every Good Thing, and Derek and Gordon have most definitely exceeded all of them, debuting at number five on the New York Times bestseller list, as well as number three on the Indie Bound bestseller list. It is my distinct honor to welcome Gordon C. James and Derek Barnes, here we are. We got everybody on screen. So welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Kim. I, I feel very lucky to have both of you. I was just telling you a few moments ago in the green room that uh, when I first uh, encountered this book, I think it was, uh, I think it was September or October. And as soon as I, I saw the cover and heard, the, you know, the title, I was like, oh man, that's, it's perfect perfect for this moment. It's a perfect book. The author, the illustrator totally nailed it. We've got to have them. And I was so happy when we found out a, a day or two later that you were game for this. So thanks for waiting all the way till September, till our schedules lined up. Uh, I appreciate you and I'm sure that our, our fans will as well. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us, Jeff. All right. Before we talk about your latest book, I want to talk about you as kids, so I so we can sort of paint a picture for our audience. Derek, uh, how would you describe yourself as a ten-year-old kid? Man, I was. Uh, I have one older sibling, Anthony, and he's seven years older than I am. And he, right now, he is a regional manager for a wine company. Yeah, and he's a, a kind of guy that wears fancy suits smoke cigars, he's the life of the party. I'm at the opposite end of that spectrum. So I was very quiet, uh, 
I was very introverted. I still am. I still consider myself a card carrying, you know, introvert. But um, I love music. You know, just coming from Kansas City, Missouri, we have you know uh, the whole lineage there is uh, jazz. You know, you know, being the home of you know Charlie Parker. Um, I was I was a huge reader, but I, I read a lot of nonfiction. Mm. I was just one of those kids that just loved to have you know information, and and it really helped me. You know, in regards to being in different rooms and having all this information and to be able to have conversations with folks from different walks of life. So, yeah, I'm just very, very, very quiet kid that just like to absorb as much music and information that I possibly could. Yeah. And Gordon, how different were you from from Derek? Were you also an observer, an introvert like him? I think I was um, I was relatively shy. I think around ten years old when I, it was kind of the point where I realized that maybe sports weren't my thing, and that was around the time when I started um, really uh, enjoying drawing. My father actually went to the high school of music and art in New York. You know, he went in as a visual arts major and came out as a vol major. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was about 10 or 11 years old, that was the year that I went to visit my cousin Dave in the Bronx. And he was actually a, uh, he was doing uh, inking work for DC Comics. Yeah. And um, he put me on the train and he took me downtown to the DC offices and everybody was going nuts over his work. And I was like, I think that's what I want to do. <laughs> like, I don't know that I want to be a comic book artist, but I just wanted that same kind of energy in my life. And yeah. so, you know, 10 years old, I was the biggest thing that I was doing is I was in the Boy Scouts, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, so, so that's really what I like doing, like, you know, Boy Scouts and riding bikes. Right, right. You know, it, you know, it, it turns out we have something in common. We not only grew up in the same town, but we were in the same elementary school at the same time, just two years apart, which is pretty wild. Uh, Fort Washington, Maryland. Like, do, do you have do you have warm feelings towards growing up in Fort Washington, Maryland, which is a suburb of uh, Washington D.C.? I love Fort Washington. I love it every time I go home to uh, visit my parents. I always enjoy being back there. I just, you know, like I, I like Fort Washington. I like PG County. You know, yeah. like I, just that whole the whole area. Uh, so do I. Actually, I just went back recently in the middle of a book tour, and I. I walked the same streets I you know, grew up on, and so it was really cool uh, to, to revisit and to feel those feelings of nostalgia again. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Jeff yeah. grew up on one of the tallest hills in the neighborhood. <laughs> you can see DC from the top of that hill. So like that was the hill, like if you wanted to prove yourself, you got on your bike and you went down that hill. And you exactly. could go down that hill across a main road without stopping, which is you do. <laughs> And then hit the corner and you would be on my street. That's hilarious. And, so like, and those who are really gutsy did it on skateboards. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, in fact, in the Wimpy Kid universe, the, uh, the Heffleys, they live on this hill and it's exactly my street. And now we're making it into something for Disney Plus. So we're basically recreating my street in animation, which is really kind of cool. Awesome. <laughs> Um, so, Derek, you, you said that you're a big reader as a kid. I'm really interested if we went back and captured your bookshelf, you know, what, what you had growing up, what were the books that really spoke to you as a kid? You know, I, I hear this question uh, asked a lot to a lot of other African-American writers of, of our um, genre, and it's pretty much the same answer. That's, I mean, that's part of the reason why, why I read so much nonfiction, because, you know, um, well, there wasn't any Barnes and Nobles around, but I, I lived in the library. Yep. And other than the books uh, written by Ezra Jack Keats, there weren't a lot of books that starred or featured any any protagonists that you know I could relate to. Yep. You know, uh, so uh, like I said, I read a lot of nonfiction. I was really into history, uh, really into the whole civil rights movement. But um, I started. I started writing because um, in the fifth grade, mm -hmm. my English teacher, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Shelby, shout out to Miss Shelby, introduced me to the writers of the of the Harlem Renaissance. And mm -hmm. at that age, I also fell in love with hip hop music. So, um, um, I just remember writing down song lyrics um, from albums. You can see I got albums up on the wall there. I used to take some of the lyrics from the liner notes from. Artists like Stevie Wonder, Run DMC, 
you know, Roberta Flack, Earth, Wind and & Fire, and copy, that, copy these lyrics, move them around. I used to add my own um, language and my own uh, 10-year-old language. And also, yeah, again, music was a huge influence on my uh, writing growing up. I, I, think, I think you can tell that now, you know, I, I try to write in a very, you know, poetic, rhythmic kind of way. Yeah, you know? that's really cool. And I, I think we're, you know, we've been learning more and more, especially lately, how important it is for kids to be able to see themselves. You know, their, their book, books need to be mirrors. It's such yeah. an important thing to have a representation of the, you know, all of society in books. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm Every Good Thing is a book about affirmations and empowerment. And your readers are told in the early pages that they're, they're good to the core, which I really like. You said like the, the uh, center of a cinnamon bun, I think. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, where did each one of you get your affirmations as a kid? Who was, who was telling you that you were good to the core? I think um, with me, my parents were very affirming. Uh, I, my, mo I had, uh, I, had well, everybody, I have two grandmothers, right? Like everybody does, right? But yeah. um, my grandmother on my father's side was like just super affirming. Like she just thought that I could do nothing wrong. And so like that is just a neat feeling to know that someone feels like you are that special. Mm. And my grandmother on my mother's side was completely awesome too, but she had a whole bunch of grandchildren. <laughs> so it's like completely different, you know. So, um, so, so, like that. She was a she was a very very big deal, and my parents were also very encouraging, as well as also always pushing. Like you, all right, that's good. All right, what's next? You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Derek, did you have anyone that set you on your path? That that their their very words set you on the path that you're on right now. Oh, uh, two people. You know, my mom. My mom uh, is from a tiny town called Clarksdale, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. uh, she has a high school education, but she became a CNA. You know, she was a, a, a nurse and she's worked in nursing homes her whole career. But uh, I, I don't know, I always, I always felt like the uh, golden child in the family. She always treated me that way. Yeah. Anything I ever needed for her, as far as books, uh, any type of, you know, writing utensils, she was always there to, you know, encourage me. And my English teacher from my freshman year in high school, she was also my creative writing teacher uh, when I was a senior, Ms. Yeah. Rogers. This woman, I know I was not as well of a writer as I am now, but everything I wrote was, you know, Pulitzer worthy, you know, to her. She was so encouraging. That's and cool. And I, I, I just never forget her, you know, and we became Facebook friends like maybe, you know, three years ago. So, man, I love that woman. She, uh, I, I can still see her, you know, the smile on her face right now. That's and cool. and, and uh, you, you know, Gordon and I just won the Charlotte uh, Huck Award, and that's the uh, um, National Council of Teachers of English. And I was, uh, I thought about her. You know, what I mean, she was the first mm -hmm. person I thought of. Yeah, and Gordon and I just found out that we had the same fifth grade teacher. I think Mrs. Oh, yeah, <laughs> and she. she um, I, what she did for me is that she encouraged me, but she also, um, I, I, she was a, a critic in a way. Is I remember one time we were putting on a um, like a talent show, it was like a Saturday Night Live skit for the talent show. And we were, it was ridiculous. Like we made this giant snake con uh, costume and we were all writhing around in it. And she walked into the room and she said, um, you need to know the difference between laughing with and laughing at. And I, and then she walked out of the room and it's just like a few things that she did like that just stuck with me and really set me on a path. So it's just so important, uh, you know, for these teachers say things that are sometimes in passing and it can really set a kid onto their career, which is, uh, which is really amazing if you think about it. And, you know, I think about that with your book is that it has so many positive messages so, uh, so, you know, so many really important and impactful words. If, if either one of you had read this book as as a kid, what what particular message do you think would have have reached you in in, in a really special sort of way, or may, maybe shocked you, or you know, uh, in its bluntness? I think that um, for, for for me, it is um, it's. It's the page that's, that's kind of the quiet 
page about um you know uh you know about um you know every once in a while being in a situation you know where you're scared i don't know if growing up i've ever been in a situation where i felt scared but um you know just you know um you know how fort washington is right so like it was diverse but sometimes you can be over at a friend's house and you can have a great relationship with that friend but maybe you'll hear something that their parents will say in passing yeah or you will be in a situation where you're out with a group of kids and that parent is treating you a little bit different than mm -hmm. um than the than the other parent than the other kids in the group yeah and i think that that type of um I think that that type of info, like that type of affirmation, you know, you know, just knowing that there are people like that out there in the world, that it's not always going to be uh, that fair, you, you know, like it's a conversation I have with my father, but I don't think that he knew exactly how early I was going to need that conversation. Hmm. And, I, and I know the page you're talking about it, and, and I read somewhere else. Uh, We'll get to it in a second, but that's just the image that goes with it. Where um, you know there 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 are these forces um, that are uh, telling the kid that you know using names for him that he he wouldn't use for himself. And I love the line where you say, "I am what I say I am." That's it's just such a great line. Uh, but actually, telling you what you can and cannot achieve. You know, right, like exactly. I had that happen at our elementary school, which we love. <laughs> right. you know? of but I had a teacher tell me what I wasn't going to be in this life. Wow. And I don't think you do that to someone in the sixth grade. No, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, I would love to get a reading of the book if you're willing, Derek. Um, if you, uh, I know you have the book there and I know. Gordon. Why not, Jeff Kenny? I have <laughs> to read it for you, man. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Before we, before we get started, you know, one thing I want to say about you, man, that I'm, I'm proud of you. And we just met like a few minutes ago. But I study other authors of every genre, especially in our genre. And I always look at them on YouTube and I, I read their stories. And for everybody that's watching that knows you, you seem like the same Jeff that when you first started that you are now. And and uh, that's what I strive to be. You know what I mean? Like I wanna I wanna put out work that really influences people. And I wanna always stay true to my art form and and, and, and try to stay centered. Because yeah. everything, you know, it's, you know, this hasn't been an overnight, overnight success. You know what I mean? Like we've been, we've been doing this for years, but uh, things can start moving fast, you know, per our conversation before we got on. And, and, and it can kind of change you. Sometimes it can change you, but you've, you haven't got your ears pierced. You have, you're not wearing a, <laughs> a little goatee and some gold chains. So, you know, shout out to you, man, for just, Staying real, you know. Well, I appreciate that. That's very yeah. high praise and probably undeserved, but thank you very much. So I'm going to show, let's see if I can make this work. Okay, here we go. You read, please. And I'll All right. Show I am a nonstop ball of energy, powerful and full of light. I'm a go-getter, a difference maker, a leader. I am every good thing that makes the world go round. You know, like gravity or the glow of moonbeams over a field of brand new snow. I am good to the core, like the center of a cinnamon roll. Yeah, that good. I am skateboard tricks, scraped knees and elbows. But you know what? I am right back on my feet again. I am one eye open, one eye closed, peeking through a microscope, gazing through a telescope, checking out those spaces around me and plotting out those far places I have yet to go, the will. I am a gentleman and a scholar. I am kind and polite like, yes ma'am and yes sir, helping my grandmother to cross the street and saying bless you when a stranger has to sneeze. I'm a cool breeze, a perfect paper airplane that glides for blocks, for miles, forever. I am a roaring flame of creativity, 
I'm a lightning round of questions and a star-filled sky of solutions. I'm an explorer planting a flag on every square foot of this planet where I belong. I'm a sponge soaking up information, knowledge, and wisdom. I want it all, and I am all ears. I am Saturday mornings in the summertime. I am two bouncers and a front flip off the diving board. I am hilarious. I am the life of the party. I'm that smile forming on your face right now. I'm the boom, bap, boom, boom, bap. When the bass line thumps and the kick drum jumps, I'm the perfect beat and the perfect rhyme keeping everything on point and always on time. But you already knew that. I am a grand slam, bases fully loaded. I'm a nasty two-handed dunk holding on to the rim just to remind you that I'm still the man. Believe that. I am the undisputed champion. I'm a highlight reel of magnificence. I am the celebration, the applause, and the standing ovation. I am victory. I'm a brother, a son, a nephew, a favorite cousin, a grandson. I am a friend. I am real. I am tight hugs and a hand to hold, a shoulder to cry on if you have to. I hope you never have to. I am here. And although I am something like a superhero, every now and then I am afraid. I am not what they might call me and I would not answer to any name that is not my own. I am what I say I am. I am that sound in the forest when the mighty tree falls. I am waves crashing gently on the shore. I am a force of nature, a miracle, a blessing. I am brave, I am hope. I am my ancestor's wildest dream. I am worthy of success, of respect, of safety, of kindness, of happiness. And without a shadow of a doubt, I am worthy to be loved. I am worthy to be loved. Thank I love you. it. That That's a great book. and. Uh, for everybody who's watching, you didn't just get that book for free. You got to click on the bottom <laughs> to purchase the book <laughs> and get a signed book plate. Let's see what you drew, Gordon. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Golly. I can't believe I can't believe somebody can possess that much talent and what a combination you, you two guys make. Um, you. So this book is so much about empowerment and, and really unapologetic ambition, which I, I really love. And yet it ends with such a humble and simple sentiment i am worthy to be loved like it's that's a quiet that's a quiet ending um why was it so important to end with that message you know um there there are a couple of reasons why i wrote this book i started it as a poem like you know after, around the time when you know trayvon martin was murdered and then i i never finished it and i picked it back up when um when Tamir Rice was murdered in Cleveland, and Michael Brown was murdered in outside of uh, outside of St. Louis, and and then uh, you know a few other murders of unarmed uh, teenage black boys happened, and I started noticing a trend that uh, this uh, narrative went well up um, that would try to paint the boy as some type of villain. You know, maybe he experimented, you know marijuana in school or maybe he had some you know type of uh post you know, on his instagram account and, and and just trying to make this child um you know the reason that he was murdered or uh shot you know but in 2018 i picked it back up because there was a, there was a major clothing company that came out with an ad where uh they had like a maybe he had to be like eight or nine year old a uh, black boy and he had a green hoodie on it and said the coolest monkey in the jungle and if you know anything about you know racial epithets in this in this country you know referring to an african-american as a monkey is akin to calling him the n-word just calling him an animal 
And so, you know, again, I'm raising four black boys. Gordon is raising one. We were black boys. And I, I'm raising four totally different boys with four totally different personalities. And it doesn't matter if the boy comes from the projects or he grew up in the suburbs. There is a community of people who care about that boy, who loves him, who lifts him up, who wants the best for his life. And so I wanted to, you know, through my words, just let the reader know that someone cares about you, but also that our boys matter just as much as every other boy in this country, that we care about and love our sons the exact same way. And I still feel for those mothers, you know, I, I still feel for those mothers who lost their child. Um, you know, Tamir Rice was 12 and he was outside playing with a toy gun. And and how many white kids that are 12 play with real guns or, or, or they go hunting? And it, he had a immediate death sentence. And that just shouldn't happen in this country, you know? Yeah. So well, I feel like that's one of the big messages of this book. And um, and it's really something that I try to practice in my life is that um, as an African-American person, you are entitled to the fullness of this world. You know, you can enjoy your neighborhood and then you should be able to go downtown and go to a museum. You should be able to go to the country and ride horses. You should be, you know what I mean? Like, like all these things that people in mainstream society feel that they should be able to do. You know, a lot of times, like if you're African-American, you got to think twice, well, where am I going? You know, what are the people going to be like when I get there? But I want, but part of it is also just believing that you belong there. Cause you know, you know, you might belong at that fish fry or that barbecue in your neighborhood with your aunts and uncles, but you also belong at a museum. You, you know, your, your parents tax, I would pay for that museum. You should be able to go. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you should feel comfortable and welcome in that space. And I hope that this book encourages it. And what um, Derek had said about the hoodie is also the reason why the uh, the the child on the last page, who who is also a Fort Washington native, um, <laughs> is wearing a uh, is wearing the green hoodie because yeah. I wanted to make sure to bring bring that inspiration full circle at the end of the book. Yeah, yeah. And the kid and the kids in the book aren't monochromatic. There's I, I read recently, Gordon, that you wanted to represent the black diaspora. Can you explain what that means? I'm I'm just learning about it. that that word. I had to look it up. I got to be honest. Well, with you. you know, we, we come like there are black people from all over the world, you know, not just that, not just American black. My all my grandparents are from the island. So I'm a West Indian American, mm -hmm. you know, second generation American American. But my so like that's part of my culture. And so like there's Southern culture and there are blacks from Africa that we're from all over. And so if you look, especially in the liner notes, you're going to see all these kids that look very different mm -hmm. because I was trying to find um, find kids that, you know, um, some look uh, look completely black. Some might be biracial and then some like, oh, this kid might look African. This kid might look Aboriginal. This kid might look um, might look Native American. You know, I was really trying to like show the uh, the visual fullness of a people, which is really hard to do in 21 illustrations. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yo, and, and Jeff, you know, you know, one of the later things uh, Gordon told me, this is after the book came out. You know what I forgot? I forgot to put a chubby kid in there. This is a really, <laughs> you know, like a rowdy type of kid. Yeah, yeah, I got <laughs> one in the liner notes, but none on the yeah. main pages. And yeah. so like, um. <laughs> You know, and that that's that's like a blind spot that I had. I grew up, I was a skinny kid. Right. And so I, draw, I draw a lot of skinny kids, right? Because, yeah. you know, we had to look for the people that that are most like us. But I really wanted to, I was hoping that as kids uh, flip through the through the book that they would see themselves. There's this kind of a chubby kid jumping off the job, jumping off the yeah. dive. <laughs> now, you know, I probably could have done a little bit better. <laughs> now, when you were illustrating, um, and we'll get to the cover model in a moment, but when you were illustrating the book, are you drawing from your memory of kids? Or are you having kids pose? Are you looking at pictures? How, how do these kids... I have kids pose. So um, yeah. pretty much, uh, especially all the main characters in the book, yeah. they are going to be people that... Um, I did a uh, model yeah. call on Facebook, and I had people come out to my studio yeah. You know, so um, a lot of those on the um, 
on the liner notes were just kids I made up. You know, yeah. I made up a whole bunch of faces. You know, um, but most of your main characters, and and some of them are um, some of them at this point are my friends' kids. You know, yeah. so I actually um, uh, I reached out to a a couple of the people that I grew up with, and I was like, "Yo, do you have any pictures of um of your kids like at this age?" And I would try to get them into the book. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you didn't make this kid up. He is he's a real li live kid. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Well, that's my son Gabriel. Yeah. And um and I was uh, excited to have him on the cover and have him featured in the book because uh, not only is Gabriel my son, but he is also diagnosed autistic. So mm -hmm. to get to give him a chance to like really really shine and represent a lot of the kids that are out there like him yep. was a big deal. And and just on that note, I hope that this book speaks for the kids that can't necessarily speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know um. You know, if Gabriel is out someplace and someone accuses him of doing something, the words are going to come to him fast enough necessarily to say, well, this is what really happened or this is what I'm doing. And so, like, for him, those bias, those biases, they're going to have a greater impact on himself because he can't always advocate for himself with the same amount of um, energy that a typically developing kid can. Yeah, well, that's really well put. Um, and I'm going to plug in my, my laptop because I see that I'm losing battery. So I'm not being rude. I'm just making sure we uh, don't fade away. You're not the only one that has to do that. I, <laughs> I, I can see me. I got to run off camera. All right, I got to plug in my, plug in my laptop. <laughs> so hold on one moment. I'll pop back up in a second. Um, so, you know, something that you stress in the book is actually the, the importance of being a, a leader, Derek. But you also say that I'm all ears, and that that really um, that stood out to me. Tell tell me what that means to tell a kid both things that they're they're they are a leader, but they're also all ears. Well, I, I feel like I'm like a living motivational speaker. You know, having 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 four sons, they've all they all play sports. They've all played sports, but you know. Just more than anything, I, I try to be a good example, you know, for them in regards to my work ethic. And I really look at what we do as a sport. Like, I really love and appreciate my peers, but I'm like coming after everybody. I, you know, I want to, I want to be in every single age group and every single genre. And being a leader, it's not just about being, you know, somebody that's you know, really aggressive. A go getter, but it's also being able to understand people, and you know, uh, try to be a good listener, absorb as much as you can, you know, from people. Yeah. Um, you know, we were just talking about that. You know, my two eldest boys. My, my eldest boy is twenty; he's a, a sophomore in college, and my sixteen-year-old is on the football team here. This is the school where they went to Olympic, and they were talking about girls. And I was just saying, you know, I, I'm looking at that from two points of view right now. First of all, no matter what I tell you right now, you're not gonna listen. <laughs> I wish you would. I wish, you know, what I'm saying, like, how many times you, know, you think back as a kid, you wish you would listen to your dad. And yeah. the second part is, you know, at my age, it's like I, I don't really care about what you're talking about with girls. I want to make sure you got that math assignment done <laughs> and, and that you're taking care of business. You know, so I'm all about achievement here, but we're also about um, you know, understanding uh, people and, 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 and having tolerance, and, um, you know, practicing, you know, empathy. And, and all of that is a part of being a leader. Yeah. And Gordon, were the, were, was there any advice that your parents or your mom or uh, your grandma repeated to you again and again, that was sort of like a catchphrase that, that you pass on to your own kids? I don't know, um, you know, somewhere my daughter is like raising her hand. She probably has the whole list of things. Yeah. But um, but one of the big things that is uh, popping into my head right now is not something that my parents said, who, and, and I'm sure they're watching. They're probably sitting at home like, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but um, I, I remember being in, um, I remember being in high school and um, I, I didn't go to the art program in my high school. I was in the college prep program and yeah. I like niggled my way into the classes, taking them for no credit in the arts program. And like, I must have really been feeling full of myself one day. And I remember my um, my third, my my uh, teacher, Miss Surratt, who, by the way, I keep a picture of her, like she's right there, <laughs> like, like close by all the time, right? And um, she, 
she just looked at me one day and she said, Gordon, just because you were born on third base, don't think you hit a triple. <laughs> and and I cool. was like, wow, OK. All right. So like I never like I just always, always, always keep working. And just to um, go back to what you were discussing with with Derek, you know, I try to impart that I, I did. I did some teaching. And whenever I talk to my students, I'm like, look, I'm going to teach you this thing and yeah. you should learn it. Right. You don't have to use it. <laughs> you should learn it and you shouldn't be afraid to learn it because I cannot suck the knowledge out of your head. <laughs> All I can do is add to it. And then what you do with it or not is your decision. So even at 47 years old, I feel like, um, you know, like when we get to this age, we're getting pretty accomplished. But there are still people that I want to take workshops with. Like, you know, they can't suck any of the knowledge out of my head or make me any less. All they can do is add to it. Oh, that's a good so, like, you, know, you should just never be afraid to put yourself in a situation where you got to listen and learn because it doesn't make you any less awesome, right? <laughs> and only add to what you've done. You know, what's really funny, Gordon, is that as, as you've been speaking, I, I did see then old friend Jeremy Holmes popped up in the um, yeah, <laughs> yeah on the right hand side of the screen. He said he's watching. I have to say this about Jeremy um, is that Jeremy was the most avid reader I've ever met. He could literally he he didn't pay any attention in school because he was always reading a book. He could read a five hundred page book a day. I'm not joking. It, it was just insane, like what he could read. And I'm realizing, like Gordon, when I first saw your picture, I was like, man, I, I think I know that guy. You said you were in in Boy Scouts. I think I was in the same Boy Scout uh, uh, troop as you at the same time because- Were you in 1026? Yeah, it was over. Yeah, yeah. It was, um, we used to do these bivouacs. Do you remember these things? We'd go out yeah. in the woods and set fires. And so you were in Chris Holmes's grade. Yep. And I, your group actually one night brought in uh, stuff to make a fire and you put uh, poison ivy on the, uh, Fire. Ooh, I wasn't there that night. I, I know that night. And I wasn't there. <laughs> goodness. People were getting poison ivy like in their eyes. And yes, like, that's oh, right. I don't know what I did, but I wasn't there. Oh, you were oh, so oh, smart oh. for not being there. But anyway, so I'm not sure if Chris. Chris yeah, because I've known Chris since we met when we were four years old. That's hilarious. And like that's he's hilarious. still one of my three closest friends. Like, <laughs> That's great. We'll say hi to him. I put that in a Wimpy Kid book, by the way. It happens in the 10th Wimpy Kid book is that the kids bring uh, poison ivy to the fire. Oh, um, right. Derek, I, I was really interested in reading about your, your school visits. I know we're in, we're in uh, you know, you posted all that about what you do and what you what kinds of outcomes you like to get uh, before the pandemic. And it's a different year right now. Um, can is there anything good that's come out of the pandemic for you? You know, there's so much sadness associated with it. Has anything good come out of it? I think you know, you know, like I said before, I'm I'm such I'm such a homebody. I don't really I don't really enjoy the uh, traveling. Mm. Um, just you know, we have we have such a large family, and I and I always try to find ways just to be alone. Yeah. Know, so I can work, you know, that's the way I recharge. But one thing I I have enjoyed is having all my sons back together again. I, I remember when, uh, you know, my eldest son left last year when he first left, it, the whole house was sad. It was almost like someone had passed away, which is pretty much how, I mean, you guys have not yeah. had, had a, a child to leave to go to college yet, but yet. when you do, man, it's, 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 uh, <laughs> It's a different type of pain. I mean, this is what you've been working towards. And now one of the stalwarts in your family is gone. So having him back home, he's yeah. been able to connect with our youngest son, which is a, a nine nine. And I, I I just enjoy having all of them together interacting and and just and, and just having that family time. But there's also a Airbnb next door and I <laughs> bought it up and I bought it up like two weeks out of the month. Just so I can get away from them. I come over and enjoy them, then I get then I get the hell out. That's but hilarious. I, I have enjoyed just having all the boys together because I know it's it's not gonna be this way forever, you know. That's true. My boy's about to leave for college and yeah, I'm already mourning his departure. Yeah, man. Uh we when when the pandemic started up in March and April, I actually um I I started work at the cemetery. So I drove my car to the cemetery, I bring a blanket, 
a bag of Skittles uh, and, and Pringles and, you know, and I'd sit in the cemetery and work all the time. So I know what that's like. It's hard to work in the home when you're, oh, yeah. when you've got your kids all around. Uh, Gordon, I feel badly that we haven't talked uh, enough about your work specifically, you know, specifically your paintings, obviously, but I am curious about, about the physical nature of them. How big are they? Are, are those the book? Okay. You know, oh, yeah. The um, let's see. Like, uh, wow. there, so these are uh, two of them from the book and uh, yeah. these are, uh, what is that? 20 by 20 by 30? Yeah. Yeah. 50, yeah 20, 20 by 30. And um, that tends to be the size of a double page spread for me. Yeah. I tried to do a book. I did this book called Letter Buck. And I was just like, you know what? I like that size. I'm going to do everything twice as big. Yeah. It was a terrible decision. It was very <laughs> ambitious, but um, but it's a lot of pain. It, it was too much. It, it was too much. <laughs> and so what I learned is that um, now in in um in what am I trying to say here? There are certain illustrations that I feel are going to be important where they will be single page spreads, spread, spread, excuse me, but I'll do them this size just, yeah. but I'll do them this size because I want to get that, I want to get that detail in. Yeah. So now what I do is I pick like what I feel are the, the key images to do them, to do them larger. And yeah. I only do like three of those now. Yeah. Did you know that? When you come out of a fine art background, just everything just has to be the best. Mm -hmm. But when you move into an, you know, an illustration project, everything has to be your best in a certain amount of time, right? <laughs> like, That's a really that, good word. <laughs> you know, That's that becomes word. the rub. And um, I'm working on that because I always feel like if I leave a second on the table, then yeah. I could have done something else. You yeah. Know? And Gordon, I'll ask you one more question before we go on to, uh, to, to questions from the audience is that, um, so many of your illustrations, I'm really glad you have the, the pool uh, picture in the background because that's my favorite. And, uh, but so many of the pictures in the book, you know, swimming pool and Derek writes about a tight hug. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there that we can't do right now or haven't been able to do for a long time. So do those images have a different meaning for you now or does it just feel like, ah, we'll get back to that, you know, soon? I future? hope, I hope that we will get back to it. But it is interesting to think that, um, you know, like uh, there could be kids reading this book who maybe had planned to spend all summer at like swim camp. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, or this is the summer they were going to learn to swim or or yeah. um, or, you know, the kids that are into the arts like uh, like this young man here rapping, you know, like um, like a lot of that stuff is on hold. So I hope maybe when they um, they maybe can look at this book and make some plans or, you know, just you know, just even just seeing people's faces when yeah. you're out and about, you know, like. Yeah, just the lower half of your face. Like what are kids missing out on right now? You know, we don't know the psychological yeah. effects. I went to a farmer's market today and they were like, oh, can we take a picture of you with your, with uh, like with your veggies? And I was holding up the, the thing with my mask on. And I was like, I'm smizing. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> That's all you can do is just try to smile with your eyes and communicate to people that you're happy. Yeah, you know, like hope maybe they can see your cheeks perking up. <laughs> no, well, I, I did a book tour. Where we took a million pictures, and I was in a mask. I started doing weird stuff with my mouth, like sticking my tongue out to the side because I was like, "Who cares?" You know. So I'm I'm worried about in the future, like you know, for for pictures, I'm going to do some weird stuff. All right, so let's uh, let's go on to questions. We have a few in the queue, and then I'd love to see some pop up on the right hand side. Um, Kim, why don't you pick one of the questions from the queue uh, and uh, we'll get us started. Okay, so we have a question from Susie. She says, do you have your next project set to do together? I hope your words and images together are simply perfection. If there is something in the works, can you share anything about it? Great. Uh, we have one more book um, and hopefully we are working on a project uh, for the near future. Uh, but our next book, uh, we signed a deal with Kwame Alexander's imprint, um, Versify, and uh, it's tentatively titled uh, Do It For The People, where uh, it's, it's, it's gonna be a, a sketch kind of graphic type book where I highlight maybe 25 uh, athletes in American history that sacrificed it all 
in order to protest for um, you know human rights against racism uh, against you know gender rights. So um, very excited about that. I'm right in the middle of it right now, and so that's hopefully awesome. it. You know, you know, that's the whole pressure of it all, man. You know, we've, we've only done two books together and they've done extremely well. So you feel like you have to knock it out of the park every time. Man. <laughs> Although everything won't be a home run, yet you still have that kind of energy. You know, like Gordon is a winner. Um, I, I feel like I win uh, every time I sit down at the computer because I think about who I'm writing for. And I wanted to have that same kind of feel and that same kind of energy, but you also want to do something different. So it's a lot of pressure, but um, you know, it's good yeah. pressure. I gotta tell you real quick, uh, I, I'm so glad to hear that you signed with uh, Versify. It's a great imprint and they're, they're producing tons of winners. We, we had the Versify group here uh, one time and there's something kind of funny is that Kwame and I, I don't know how it got started, but he and I sort of, <laughs> We'd go at each other a little bit uh, on stage, and it's like something that every time we do it, we just go at each other, and it's supposed to be playful. And this one time, uh, Kwame asked me, he said, hey, Jeff, I need your uh, blurb a book for me. And he said, but really just, just come at me like you do, right? And so I sent him a list of like 10 insults, like about the clothes he wears, and <laughs> everything. Like it was about his writing, about it just it was, like, you know, do, please buy this book because Kwame Alexander needs a decent pair of jeans, all this stuff, right? <laughs> and, then, um, and then they used all of them. So on the back of the book, there's like this paragraph of insults from me to Kwame. And I'm so nervous when that book comes out that people are going to be like, what kind of guy is Jeff? I'm really nervous about that. But he, he, was, he was the first person that called me in 2018 after, after all the awards were announced. Yeah. And I remember I was sitting in the car. I, I went to uh, a Chipotle. Uh, Gordon and I had an interview that day, and I just stopped and I grabbed a burrito. And I was sitting in the car, and it was raining, and I, I was I, I was on cloud ten thousand. And then he was the first person to call. That's awesome. He didn't say hello or anything. He was like, "Yo, you think you can do a graphic novel <laughs> in verse?" I was like, "Sure." He said, "All right, cool." Then he just hung up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that. And here we are. That's so cool. All right, Kim, give us another one. Okay, this is from Janine, and she would like to know, did the words or illustrations come first, or did you collaborate throughout the entire process? I think uh, our process is more collaborative than others. Most of the time, um, I would never even know the author. We meet when it's time to do a book signing or something like that, but I knew Derek, and um, he generally, the, the words generally come first. And so that, so I knew Derek, but I got a chance to like uh, this, for these projects, I generally get, I'm trying to get my thoughts straight here. I generally get the manuscript through our agent, but Derek just emailed me the book. And so with I'm Every Good Thing, I think it's a neat story. Like um, he emailed it like late, it was 1130, 12 at night. I get up really early in the morning. And I just remember being in bed, reading it on my phone. And my wife was out on the couch, like doing work. And so I yelled out, I was like, Ingrid, I'm going to send you something. You need to read it now. Right. And I sent it out and she was like, I love this. I was like, it's really good. Like, we're, like none of us, like, 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 you know, both of us too tired or lazy to just like walk a few feet to each other. You know what I mean? But but it's just one of those things like, you know, sometimes when you read something, you you know exactly what it is. And so I was looking very forward to getting started on it. And I, I'd like to tag on to that question, Derek, is that when you wrote uh, Crown, you didn't actually have an illustrator. And then, of course, you were paired up with Gordon, who I know you had met before. But when you so you, when you wrote this book, you were aware of Gordon's style. Did his style in a way influence the words? It, you know, did it does it work like that or does it only work in one direction? No, I, I, so the way Gordon works, and I, I'm not too sure if every artist works his way, but I think when he reads the manuscript, uh, he, he already sees scenes play out and he may pull from a certain phrase or from a certain word. And I can already see the uh, images because I know he's a fine artist and he has a fine artist background. And he always, he always says that, you know, his, his art may be the first exposure that 
a child has to find art. A child that may, may not have no um, gone to a museum. So I think this second time around, I did write thinking that he would uh, find a way to pick certain pieces out of certain stanzas or certain phrases and just make them, you know, museum museum worthy, which yeah. is what he ended up doing. So. And I love that you you know that Gordon is that in, what a privilege it is to expose kids to to something like that for the very first time. That's that's really cool. Uh, Jeremy Holmes wrote, okay. So did the did the two of you collaborate at Hallmark? Were there cards or products that you can still remember being proud of? So uh, it's well established in your lore that you both worked at Hallmark at the same time. That's where you first saw each other. Um, and so uh, Jeremy wants to know if there's something that you put on your your tombstone as your your um, your Hallmark card that should be remembered. We never worked together at Hallmark. <laughs> <laughs> took us took us hey, eighteen years to finally get together. Yeah, to finally finally do a project together. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. And, and a question about that though, Derek, did you? So you were the first uh, black male uh, copywriter for Hallmark. D is there a card that in particular that you're you're proud of? You know, um, working at Hallmark again, I I, I, I learned the whole phrase. Of trying to craft your own voice, and you know, there, there were so many talented people there, you know, writers, illustrators, and I also, you know, I got familiar with working with the editors because you would actually sit in the editorial room, and then they would tell you straight to your face the, the things that you need to work on or things that did not work, and so I, I actually love the editorial process because you know you can only have one set of eyes. And you could, and you know, as you know, you could you could fall in love with characters. You can fall in love with stories if you sit with them too long, you know, by yourself. So, working there, I enjoyed the editorial process. But it was one card I wrote, and it's just from a this from a black man's point of view. We have to write thank you cards, mm -hmm. and so I I found the image, and it was just two black men right in the middle of a crown, giving each other crown, and then when you open it up. It was a beautiful black and white photo. We opened up. It says, "Good luck and out." And it took like maybe two months for them to okay this card because it's like they they didn't think that it was sad. It ended up being my best seller. You know, it, it was a a mahogany card, and it was a thank you card for black men. Yeah. Good looking out. That's all it said. And, and that's cool. They finally did it, and um, ended up being a hit card. So. Oh, that's awesome. And Gordon, this is not a question, but from my wife who wrote 15 minutes ago, she said, Jeff's son is admiring your artwork, Gordon. Quote, how is someone that talented? I think that is what we call a rhetorical question. But oh, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna do one more question. Hopefully it's our best one. Uh, Kim, why don't you go ahead and read our upvoted question? Okay, this is from Juliana. And she would like to know, what advice would you give to someone who dreams of publishing a book with their own underrepresented voice to bring multicultural stories to more classrooms? Let's go, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so um, I, I would say, um, you know, uh, it's, I would say like, if you wanna be an illustrator or an artist of any kind, I'm gonna answer more generally. Um, the biggest thing that you can do is practice your craft. You know, uh, for me, it's just draw, draw, draw all the time. Keep a sketchbook with you, keep your iPad with you, whatever you like to draw with, however you like to draw. And um, as you start to put your work out there, like continually put your work out there. Like if you're a fine artist, show. If you're an illustrator, you know, work with friends, work, you know, get in local magazines, just do whatever you can do to keep working because people have to know that you exist. And so um, just everything good that's happened in my life has happened through word of mouth, you know, like all the best shows, you know, like I think Hallmark is the only job I ever applied for and all the rest have been people have just heard have, of me and I found me, I got my first book because Shane W. Evans couldn't do it. And he was at Hallmark too at that time. Walked over my cubicle, hey, if you wanna do this book, I'll put you in touch with this lady. And now she's my agent and she's been and Derek's agent. We've been with her over 20 years. Wow. So yeah. thing I would just say, just like keep doing, keep working, keep writing. And you know, don't let 
if, if people aren't checking for your work, don't, that's not the point. You know, I think the joy is in the creating. And then when everybody likes it, that's the great D, you know? And Derek, do you want to add to that? I think, you know, in regards to writing, it's it's a little bit more challenging because there's no there's no real entry point. You know, like you can look at Gordon's work and tell that he's had um, he's had training, but you know, in our work, I think people get it you know misconstrued that um, you know because there's such so such little words in a picture book that they could do it or anybody could do it. And writing greeting cards is similar to writing picture books. Where you have to cram all of all this emotion into just a, a few pages or a few words, but you know, just piggybacking off of what Gordon said, if you write, write, continue to read every single thing that you get your hands on. Um, I'm working on my second, my third novel right now, and I haven't written a novel in about ten years. So I, I took a whole time off for like two months to read three novels that I pinpointed. And I just try to absorb other people's writing styles, you know, devices that they may use. I, I, I read, uh, you know, some old poetry and I just try to weave that into my own voice. So I, I just think you need to surround yourself with, with people who have the same type of desire, the same type of passion that you have about whatever art, you know, that you're creating. And you will end up where you're supposed to end up. You know, all three of us, and uh, three totally different stories on how we got where we are. There's no uh, textbook answer to end up uh, being a published uh, best-selling author or you know illustrator. You just you just have to put in the work. You have to you have to continuously work on your craft. You know. Well, Gordon and Derek, your writing and your illustrations are are a gift to the world. Or paintings are a gift to the world. Uh, thank you so much for this book. We feel so privileged to have had you uh, tonight as our guests, especially for so long. I know you've done a lot of this, like I said, especially leading up to the holidays. And I've been watching the comments on the right-hand side. People are very touched by your work. Um, thank you so much. And everybody, uh, Kim is about to remind you what the link down below does, but I just wanna say, gentlemen, it has been a real privilege uh, for me. Thank you so much for letting me live in your world for the night. Same um, here, man. Thank you, thank you. Next year, hopefully, we'll be uh, we'll be able to you know once the world opens back up, and I'm very optimistic that it will. We'll get a chance to come up there and see that beautiful bookstore you got. I'd love that. Hey, bring Kwame with you. We'll go at it. Right. <laughs> Kwame will bring you on the bus. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Excellent. And Kim, why don't you bring us on? Awesome. All right. Oops, I wasn't expecting that, but here we go. All right, awesome. Thank you so much for being with us. This is a really special event. And we have plenty of copies of, of their amazing book. So please, we have signed book plates. Thank you for doing that, guys, too. It's I know oh, we yeah. all have a lot going on. So um, that's it. Thank you so much for being with us. And happy holidays, everyone. Stay safe. Right. Take care. Thank you.